Welcome to Real Hope Community Church, whether you're joining us in the parking lot or in our sanctuary here or online. We're so glad you're here. We just encourage you to draw close to the Lord and lift up your voice to uh, express your worship to the Lord. Let's stand.
God, we acknowledge this morning that it is your Holy Spirit that gives life. You hovered over the oceans, over the seas, in creation. It is your Spirit, Lord God, that gave life to our church gives life to us individually. It's your spirit that draws us into life, into Christ. So we want to continue to invite you into our lives as the one who gives us life. Thank you so much.
there's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of love, where my heart becomes free. My shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Yes, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Yes, now. Nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I tasted it. Sweetest of love, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Oh. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here, come flood this place and fill the atmosphere, your glory, be overcome by your presence, Lord, oh, your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord, come, your presence, Lord. become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness.
Spirit, you are welcome. You're welcome, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hear your people lift, crying out to you, Lord. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Lord God, we invite you, your Holy Spirit, Lord God, your transforming spirit. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. and mighty God in three persons blessed Trinity holy 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 all the saints Listen, Lord, as they adore you, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim, they are falling down before. it out. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. Yes, Lord, there is none, there is none beside you, Lord, perfect in power and love and purity. Yes, you are perfect in power. Almighty, all thy work 
shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. and mighty God in three persons blessed Trinity you are God in three persons blessed Sovereign God, holy God, God who rules over the nation, sovereign God, <laughs> God of all history, Lord God, I just want to say that none of this, none of this that has come as such a disappointment and such a whatever you want to say is ever a surprise to you we thank you god you you see everything all at once you know and you're there before and you're there to greet us lord god at the point of our need at the point of our crisis and so god we meet you right now we meet you lord god right in our situation whether that's a personal situation that only you know just we're going through whether that's a situation like like all of us are going through this COVID 19 thing and uh, looking at our government and going like, Lord, deliver us. Lord God, bring peace. Bring peace, Lord, to our world. You are the God of peace. You are the God of peace who speaks, who speaks powerfully to the waves in our lives, the seas that roar and rage against us. And you say, peace be still. You are the sovereign God. You are sovereign still in all things. Thank you, God. You are sovereign over our joys. You bring those to us, Lord God. And you hear our cry, Lord. I ask you, Lord God, not right now, as we lift up our prayer, that you would hear us. I want to I wanna lift up Sid. Isidro Hermino who is going to be leaving for the Philippines this uh, Thursday and probably, hopefully, will be returning to us in March. But I ask you, God, that you would not only send him to check on his property, Lord God, but that you would send him with a renewed spirit for Jesus, a, a renewed zeal, Lord, for his countrymen in the Philippines. That you would send him in the Holy Spirit and bless him in every way, Lord God to fulfill your purposes, and Lord God, prosper him. Look at his faithfulness, Lord God, and bless him. And just because you are the God who loves him, I ask you too that you bless him. I ask you that you keep him safe in his coming and safe in his going. I also want to lift up Tina, who has some challenging circumstances uh, in her life as far as her eyes. She's, um, they don't know really what's going on. They took an MRI and and But Lord, I know that you're able to reach into those places and see into those places that we're not able to see, that the doctors are not able to see, even with uh, MRIs and, and CAT scans and PET scans and all sorts of ultrasounds, all those kind of things, Lord God. You see what's going on in her body. And I just ask you to um, give her... Uh, give her wellness, Lord. Give her health. Restore her eyesight... You have done it, Lord God, restore sight to the blind, and, and I believe, Lord God, with all my heart, that you still do that today, so that's what we're asking you to do, is to heal her eyes. And Lord, for Jeff, our brother Jeff, uh, who had an operation on his heart, is still recovering. I know that the doctors need wisdom. They, they, they haven't figured this out, that his medications yet, and so that's causing some imbalance in his system, and I just ask you that you... Uh, clarify to the doctors, give them wisdom so that they would know what's going on. Lord God, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus.
who gave himself for us, and if God gave his only son for us, will he not much more give us all things? God will not withhold any good thing from those who walk uprightly. And Lord God, we are we're seeking you. We're following you, Lord God. We're seeking to follow you in every way, to bless you, to honor you with our lives. And so we ask you, God, to hear our prayers, answer our prayers, so that your name can be praised in this place, so that your name can be lifted up on high, so that there will be shouts of praise, God, in your house. For the, for the sake and for the name and the glory of Jesus Christ, we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right, do we have some scripture reference coming up on the slides? Well, last week we talked about stumbling over our tongue, tripping over our tongue. And this week we're going to be talking about the taming of our tongue. And so we're going to be turning uh, to James 3. Why don't you turn there in your Bibles? I want to encourage you to bring your Bible every week because we can't supply them we usually do that but I I love it that people come and they bring their Bibles and they mark in them and they circle things and highlight it because they want to go like oh I want to remember this so please do that each week it's pretty amusing um, uh, when you look at some animals some you know pets uh, especially like dogs I guess this is a big thing and their owners uh, I was looking online, and I was like checking that out, and it was some pretty funny uh, things that, that I found, and Ryan has uh, gotten some, some pictures for us. Can you, show, can you show us that? There we go. Fluffy, and, and uh, what would the lady's name be? What's that? Yeah, the poodle hair. Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right. Yes, that's the one. That's the one I saw. The... <laughs> I love that. So there are these, you know, this is probably a little, I'm not sure that guy, the priest actually had a dog like that, but I think it's still funny. So, <laughs> Isn't it true, though, that the personality of dogs kind of match the personality of, of uh, their, their owners? But have you ever noticed that a dog... Uh, that is well-behaved and gentle, a lot lot of times, the owner is like that as well. They they seem, the personality or the the demeanor, maybe the character of the owner seems to come out in the dog somehow. In a recent study by William Chopik, who is a research psychologist at uh, MSU, Michigan State University, concluded that whether by conscious training or just day-to-day interaction with our pets, uh, in in this case it was the dog, that... uh, that, um, we as the owner of the dog are the shaper of its behavior. The trainability of dogs. Mankind has been training animals for a really long time. Um, you know, for the tilling of soil and, and for the packing of heavy items, you know, uh, going up mountains in the Himalayas. Uh, the Egyptians and Greeks and Romans and Bedouins trained animals like camels and donkeys to carry loads like that. Now, the ancient Egyptians used homing pigeons as early as like 3,000 B.C., in other words, 5,000 years ago. Before the invention of the automobile, there were uh, uh, horse-drawn stagecoaches. Now, listen to this list. This is funny. Cats and monkeys and ferrets and even boa constrictors can act as service animals, you know, that help humans with things like strokes. And I'm thinking like, so how does that work with the boa constrictor? Does the boa constrictor like wrap itself around there and like hug it really tight and say, basically indicating you're going to have a stroke? Well, I would have had the stroke without whatever. You're giving me a stroke. I don't know. Anyway, I'm just, I'm just wondering how that works with the boa constrictor. Canines are super helpful with, uh, for law enforcement to locate and pursue suspects, sniff out bombs and detect and locate drugs. Uh, help fire investigators sniff out accelerants used by arsonists. So certainly James' words in chapter 3, verse 7, are truer today than ever. Uh, All kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and sea creatures like the dolphins at SeaWorld uh, are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But listen carefully to the words that he begins verse 8 with. 
but no human, now before it says, humans are taming all kinds of animals, right? But verse 8, but no human can tame the tongue. Yeah, I mean, you think about it. We try in various ways, you know, the best of our intentions, and many, many times we do a pretty good job of keeping our tongue quiet, but then emotions and anger and frustration and, and, and you know, fear gets the best of us, and the truth of what James is saying here just comes rushing back on us. Since James is telling us clearly that it is, you know, impossible for humans to tame the tongue, how are we going to tame our tongue? Because isn't that part of what we want to be? James is saying we are going to need help. And I want us to consider the idea of a dog and its relationship to its owner. The concept of of the dog choosing its owner is it's foreign. It doesn't really exist. In, in a literal way, uh, if, if a person wants to, if they decide they want a dog, what do, they, what do we do? We decide we want a dog, we go to a breeder, we go to a, an animal rescue, or we go to a pet shop and, and go like, no, 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 uh, you maybe, no, I think I'll take that one. And we choose that. The dog doesn't have any real choice in the matter. But that is not the way it is with God. Those of us who have become believers know this, that at some point, we realized that we needed to be rescued. And that idea and realization grew and grew inside of us until we wanted to be rescued. We chose God. We said, we cried out to God, say, God, rescue me. There's no one else who is able to rescue me. God, rescue me. My good works, my trying, all my struggling and frustration to be good is a failure, God. It's not that I'm totally broken. I have some good things about me. There are some good things that I do. But at the core of who I am, God, I am broken. And I want to be rescued. And I need to be rescued. And you're the only one who's able to rescue me. And we found out about this owner named Jesus who said that he would rescue us if he would let us become his owner. Jesus said, I will rescue you. And this is so important. We don't understand this. We're we're being told... One kind of gospel, but this is the gospel right here. Jesus said that he would rescue us if we would let him be our owner. And that sounds sort of different than we've been told. It sounds like, wait a minute, I, I thought I was free. And Jesus says, this is the deal. I will be, I will rescue you if you let me become your owner and take care of you in the way that I take care of you. A dog that has a good owner has a very different outlook on on life than a dog in the wild. A dog in the wild assumes it has to fend for itself. It watches out for predators. It has no one. It knows it has no one else to take care of itself. It has to fight off other wild animals. It's always got its ears up. It's always got its eyes looking for predators who are coming for itself. It is either eat or be eaten. That's the mentality of a dog in the wild. Without Jesus, we are like a dog in the wild thinking about how we're going to survive, how how we're going to be able to survive on our own efforts. Constantly on guard against potential enemies. Either running away in defeat and fear. Or being the aggressor and fighting our way through life. God wants us to know that the kind of owner he is is different. 
He will always be there to pr- provide everything that we need. There was a, a guy who wrote a book called, and I want you to write this down if you don't know this already. Philip Keller wrote a book called A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. Incredible book. Really insightful book. He also wrote a book called um, Lessons from a, a Sheepdog. You see, Philip was a, wanting to be a cattle farmer, and he bought a piece of property and, um, with the intention of having cattle on it. And it was so, such a mess that nobody was really interested in. But when the owner uh, laid out the price, he knew that he, would, he could buy the land, but he couldn't buy cattle. So he decided to start with sheep. He had a cattle dog, but he didn't have a sheep dog. He needed a sheep dog. So he looked in the paper, and eventually a sheep dog became available. And when he called the lady, the lady was aggressive and abrasive and you know she didn't talk well about the dog she she said come and get him if you can do anything with him he's yours (laughs) and so he thought he would go and look at the dog and and he met the lady at the door and the same sort of thing the demeanor the lady had uh continued and then she took him to the dog and immediately when the dog saw philip The dog lunged at him and wanted to bite him. And right before he got to him, frightened as Philip, the dog failed within, you know, distance. And he looked behind the dog and saw that he was pinned by a chain. And that he was also hobbled, his legs together, so he couldn't do anything. And he said, the poor pathetic sight, I I knew this dog was a twisted had been, this two-year-old dog had been twisted and tortured by mistreatment by this lady who didn't understand dogs, didn't know how to be an owner, didn't know how to care and love and lead a dog in the way a dog does. Such great, he, he looked at the dog and he said, I saw such magnificent potential in the dog that the dog would have to Learn me as an owner. He would have to understand who I was. And the, he, they crated the dog and put it in, in, the, in the vehicle. And on the way home, Philip said, I, I tried to do- talk, where I talked soothingly in low and, and reassuring tones, but the only thing I got back were growls and snarls. I put my hand to let him sniff it and That was a dangerous thing to do, and he withdrew his hand. There was only rejection coming from the dog. He had become in his mind like a dog in the wild, knowing that it was just him. He was on his own as a dog. He knew that even his owner wasn't looking out for his welfare. And he he had become... Instead of a trusted, trusting dog, he'd become like a dog in the wild. God wants us to know that he, the ways that he loves us, and he speaks to us in reassuring tones, in comforting tones. And what is our response? I just want you to think about that sometimes our response to a loving God who wants to rescue us, who wants to be our owner in, a, in the most incredible way that we, we can ever imagine or hope for, that God, sometimes our response to that God at any time of our life can be sometimes snarled because we have what we have experienced in our life. It could be rejection. It could be removal. It could be like running away. Philip tried week after week to to gain the trust of this dog, speaking comfortably, again, uh, providing food, providing shelter, providing everything that that this dog would need. But it was always rejection, rejection, rejection. He provided everything, and yet there was rejection of this good owner. And finally he said, I had to do what my heart 
did not want to do. My heart was broken, but I knew that I had to release the dog to let it have its will. And so it ran from the cage into the forest as fast as that dog could run. It was hoping it would return. But there was no sign of the dog. He has neighbors. Have you seen this dog? Have you heard any barking? Have you, any, anything? He asks all the questions that could possibly clue anybody in of the presence of the dog or the, 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 you know, that the dog was still somewhere in the territory. And one evening, the dog appeared kind of silhouetted on the knoll beyond. Way out, way out. And Philip began to know and realize that there might, might maybe be hope. Maybe. And so he put food out again and again and again. And he didn't find it gone. Didn't find it gone until several days later. But still the dog would not come close, would not come close. And one evening, at twilight, Philip was leaning against a post. His arm was dangling down. And all of a sudden, he felt the warm lick of his dog, who he had spoken to lovingly and done everything that he knew. And finally, he began to have hope that maybe she would begin to understand who he was. Who he was. And the, and the snarls went away, and the rejection went away, and that was the beginning of a long and very tender relationship between dog and owner. God wants us to know that he is a different kind of owner, an owner that will love us and take care of us. And, and that will begin to do something to us first on the inside, and then that will work itself on the outside. And that's part of what I want to talk to you today about, is I want to give you three training tips that will help us tame our tongue. Because our tongue really, as Jesus says, out of the overflow of our heart, that's what, our, what happens. That, that's where the, what we do with our mouth, our words, our snarls, our tone that comes from our heart. And it expresses sometimes lots of deep hurt and woundedness and neglect and abuse. And so the words of our heart are, are expressing, are, are, are being expressed. And so I want to talk about the taming of the tongue in the context of three different training tips. Number one, listen to your owner's voice and tr learn to trust it. Listen to your owner's voice and learn to trust it. If you have ever looked into God's Word, you will see that a lot of things uh, in God's Word center around the themes of how God wants His people to treat others. It's an outflow of Him. It's an outflow of Him. The Ten Commandments talk about us only speaking honest words to each other. Right? Because God is a God of truth. It talks about only speaking honoring words about our parents. And I know that can be challenging. God wrote that at the time. He knew it would be challenging. Think about that. God wrote this after Cain and Abel. God wrote this with full knowledge of what humanity, how humanity sometimes destroys each other and how parents are not always, you know, the greatest. But he still says this, and it's in his wisdom and not ours that we trust what he says, that we listen to his voice and learn to trust what he is saying to only speak honoring words about our parents. Uh, the Ten Commandments speak about not flaking out on our promises, especially our marriage promises. Now, the book of Leviticus is an interesting place to look for the goodness of God. 
It's a rule book. It's a law book. It's like do this and do all this different stuff. But listen to what it says in verse 19, kind of in the middle of the, of the book. It says, be good to the immigrants. Treat them like, you, like, like they're citizens of your own country and treat them like you do your own family. That is not a boring book. <laughs> we miss a lot of this stuff because we are assuming that maybe God is a rule giver and not a lover at heart. God is a lover at heart. Huh. In Matthew 27, 37, and 9, Jesus sums up all of God's laws, which are the same, you share the same heart as Jesus. It says, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your, what, neighbor just like you do yourself. The way that you love yourself, the way that you want to be treated, love other people like that. In other words, it's kind of a flipped around version of the golden rule. But don't those commandments sound like good commandments? (laughs) Commandments that as we follow them, make us a pretty good neighbor dog, wouldn't you say? If we follow what God says for us to do, we would be the best neighborhood dog. Everybody would want to pet us and be around us and have us around their kids and trust us. We'd be like, that's a great dog. (laughs) We would be the best neighborhood dogs. (laughs) And commands that if we followed them would make our neighborhood a great place. If, our, if all of our neighborhood would obey that, the honesty, the honoring, the keeping of our promises would make our neighborhoods and our communities and our state and our nation a great place to live. This is what our nation was founded on. Honesty, honoring, keeping our promises, faith in the Lord, trusting Him, listening to His voice, and t- learning how to trust God's voice. I want to mention four direct commands that Jesus gives us in Scripture uh, that talk directly about our tongue. Four commands that talk directly about our tongue. Here they are. God commands us to use our tongue to encourage others. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Keep encouraging one another and building each other up just like you're already doing. Church, if there's anything that we need in today, it is encouragement. It's Positive words that are grounded in real hope, not just positivity. You can say anything you want. Oh, this is going to work, whatever. You can say anything you want that sounds good, sounds hopeful. But this is grounded, um, uh, Thessalonians 5.11 is grounded in real truth. It's, it's truth. It's hopeful truth. Not truth that's a maybe so, hope so, but it's real truth that, encur- that this encouragement is coming from. And did you, did you notice that Paul, what Paul tacks on the, this phrase, just like you're already doing. He says, I know you're an encouraging church. Uh, I see how you greet each other. I see how you, you're good to each other. I see that you, you love each other. And I see that you encourage each other. And he says, and don't stop now. Keep on doing it. Keep on encouraging each other. Number two, God commands us to use our tongues to heal others. Proverbs 12, 18 is sort of a, a proverb in contrast. A lot of the proverbs are uh, two contrasting things. He says, there is a person whose rash words are like sword thrusts. And do you know that it is, see the plural, thrusts? It's not like, and you're done. It's like over and over. It's, wow, what a picture. He said, there is one whose rash words, whose thoughtless words, whose inconsiderate words are like, a sword that's just thrusting in and out. There are enough people that we have in our life who say hurtful things, careless things that even without thinking uh, have a kind of an uh, impact on our a life with their words. That's why God inspired the writer of Proverbs to, to honor the ones who don't do that. The second phrase of verse 18 says this, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Man, we, we need to, to get on that and, and really think about that. Try to be that wise person that brings healing. Number three thing that God commands us directly to do. God commands us to use our tongue to bring grace to others. 
Colossians 4, 6, let your conversation. Today we're going to have conversation. You're going to go out to, to dinner with people. And you're going to have conversation. You're going to have conversation in your home. You're going to have a conversation uh, with somebody in, in the grocery line. You're going to have a conversation at school. You're going to have a conversation. All, you know, your, our life is made up of varieties of conversation. And so God commands us, l- don't let any wholesome words come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their need. Wow, pretty poignant words, that it may benefit those who listen. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm off. <laughs> it says, pardon me, Colossians 4, 6, let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt, and that is a word picture for truth that preserves life, so that you may know how to answer people. Have you ever gotten to a point where you're like, somebody says something and all of a sudden you, you don't know how to answer them? Because, like, if I said what I'm thinking right now, that would not be good. No, it would not be good, it would not be helpful, it would not be anything constructive, and it might uh, make things worse. So, so it says, let your conversations always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. You need to be careful. Uh, We need to be careful to not be so fact-driven. Facts are really good. But facts sometimes, just all by themselves, are not really helpful. We need to, we need to not be so fact-driven that we, have, we gloss over the reality of someone's pain, someone's dilemma, someone's difficult situation. Even if they've created it for themselves. You're like, well, pfft. What do you think? (laughs) You know, we need to be not so fact-driven that we forget how to give grace to people in their pain, but not so supposedly grace-given that we avoid speaking the truth. Jesus had this way of speaking truth and grace. Two words that, that sort of stand out in this verse that I read in Colossians 4, 6. Let your conversation always always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Always and everyone, to me, stand out. I don't know what stands out to you, but in all sorts of situations, whoever is in the conversation, always gracious to everyone, no matter if you agree with them politically or not, no matter if you agree with their lifestyle or not, no matter if you agree with their doctrine or not, no matter if you agree with their decision or not, no matter if you agree with their whatever, we live in a day when, our, when if you say something, you might lose a lifelong friend just because you disagree with them. What an awful place to live. What an awful kind of relationship. Like, what in the world? Doesn't our friendship, doesn't our relationship... Aren't, can't we talk, at least talk about this? Nope. I'm never Facebooking you. Whatever. Have you, you've experienced that. Some of you have experienced that. Good friends of mine have experienced that. Uh, commandment number four that God gives directly about our tongue. God commands us to use our tongue to build up others. In Ephesians 4.29, do not let, this is when I'm supposed to read this now. (laughs) Don't let any unwholesome words come out of your mouth. Don't let them escape your mouth. But only uh, what is helpful for the building up of others according to their need that it may benefit those who listen. You know, when uh, when you're dishing up your plate at a potluck or, you know, in the salad bar or whatever, and you come to this dish, it's like, I got worms in it. I am almost positive if you see those worms, you're not putting that in your plate and you're definitely not putting it in your mouth. When you reach into the fridge for a nice cold glass of water and you pop the lid on that and you bring it up to your mouth and you go like, hmm, something smells wrong. (laughs) You're not drinking that. (laughs) You know, when you get to the pizza and it's been like four or five days or whatever and it's like good natural pizza. And you, and you lift out the lid and something is growing on that sucker. 
new life forms are you know emerging as you look at that you're like oh, garbage that's what unwholesome is don't let any thing come out of your mouth that would be that would not be good for others to consume to listen to and you can talk about gossip or anything but just it's anything that we say that is not good for people to hear yeah i don't need to hear that i don't need to hear that it's not going to make you grow it's not going to make you mature it's not going to make you uh encourage it's not going to build you up no it says only what is helpful only what is healthy i want to say only what is healthy to hear that build up each that build others up according to what they need you know uh, the other thing too about this verse is some you might have some really great information that might excite you and all this kind of stuff but it, if it's not relating to you know if it's not something that's really going to genuinely be good for them uh, aren't you just kind of flapping your jaws and just like hey i'm an interesting person <laughs> you know you know what is really going to help this person That's what we got to think about, is what is really going to be helpful. Those are wholesome things. Uh, My second point, staying with James' idea that we're going to need help taming our tongue, the second tip to taming the tongue is imitate your words, or your owner's words and responses. When I think of Jesus, uh, how Jesus spoke to many people that he met in such a variety of situations, I can honestly say that he loved us with his words how is it that prostitutes who were rejected by the pharisees and the jewish leaders were so amazingly attracted to jesus who could have shamed them who could have listed all their sins but somehow they were attracted of him because of his grace john uh, lays this out for us in john 1 17 when he says the law was given to us through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John is saying that Jesus, when Jesus spoke, grace just poured out of his mouth onto people in all kinds of situations. Isn't that challenging? You know, when, when, you know, when things are kind of rough in your relationship, you don't agree with some, whatever it is that's causing this struggle and the strife in your relationship you don't want to say nice things to those people i mean right am i am i am i just all alone in this <laughs> I, i'm sorry I, I there are people i'll just say there are people on the street not the protesters but the other people who are causing havoc i have had to really process my heart for them in order to get to the place where i'm praying for them not just like turn them around, but look, God, show them your love. God, bring them to, to a place where they understand who you are. And they can hear your gentle, cry, your gentle uh, voice over their screams of anger. Over their snarling. <laughs> you know, meet them in their quiet time so that they can hear your voice. But that's not what I would normally, I should say, that's what, not what I would naturally do. God has to come in and tame my tongue and turn my heart around so that I speak words of grace and love over those people and about those people and to and for those people. Crowd, crowds of people talked about the way Jesus spoke to them. Luke 4.22 says, And everyone spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming out of his mouth. I wish people, I wish that could be honestly said about me. But I know that that's not always the truth. It's not always the truth. Yes, I am a work in progress. More of a work than progress. <laughs> Jesus wants us to imitate who he is. And if we allow Jesus to be our owner, that is what emerges, is 
that as, as Jesus is our owner and we begin to imitate Him, we become like Him. The third tip I want to give you, the third training tip I want to give you is, and you've seen this on bumper stickers and I love it. I love seeing it every time. Wag more and bark less. <laughs> When dogs, a, a dog wags his tail, it, it's usually a sign that it's happy and content and excited about life. And shouldn't that characterize us, that we are happy because of what the Lord has done for us, and we're content because of who Jesus is in our life, and we are excited about life because we know that Jesus is with us and loves us and cares for us, and he has authority in our life that, that you know, because he is our owner, and we're giving him ownership in our life and so he's a lot he we're allowing him to do wonderful things in his life and as we allow him to do more and more we see like wow why didn't i do this earlier in my life why didn't i do this as a as a as a you know this age why didn't i do this you know and we, the farther back we go like yeah that would have been such a great idea <laughs> When a dog is constantly barking, you know, demanding attention, whining for what it wants, being territorial and on the alert for intruders, that's kind of an unpleasant dog to, to hang out with. Just like, wah, 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 wah. Oh, like, wow, it's not fun, it's no fun. Likewise, when we bark our demands, not willing to be satisfied, we're on constant alert, we're on constant red alert modes. Uh, speaking dire warnings about dangers or defensively you know guarding our territory with our words and with our action it, it doesn't make it pleasant for others it doesn't that's not the way jesus is but when we keep our mind on god's goodness to us and we live in the knowledge of god's constant care and protection and we remember not our needs, not our problems, not our issues, not our situation, but we remember our owner. The compassion of our owner who was willing to say, or who, who said, I, I, I want to rescue you. I want to rescue you. I, I will rescue you. But, I, but, I, but in order for you to really experience all that I have for you, I need to become your owner. Will you let me do that? Will you really let me do that? Will you listen to my words? Will you uh, follow my lead so I can direct you so that you can become a reflection of who I am? And will you wag more because you remember. You remember how good I am to you. And God's not bragging. He's just, he's just saying, I want to be so good to you. I want to love you like nobody else has loved you. Will you let me do that? Will you let me do that? Will you? God's love for us is far more, far more than we ever have allowed him to show us. But I want to let you know that 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 third thing about wagging more, you know, when, when we come in here and we, the music starts, and, and we, if we're really prepared to express our gratitude and our thankfulness and our worship and our appreciation to God for all he's done, and we try to remember, remind me, Lord, of all the things, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember now, you did this for me. You did, you know what? We're going to have a lot of worship wagging going on. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of people in here wagging their tails and just worshiping God. And we're going to bark a whole lot less. And all that barking is going to go away. Hey, let's, let's continue to worship and just respond to God's goodness. I just, I want you to really lean into this song as an expression of, of God's goodness to us. That before the creation of time, God had us on his mind.
before the Lord. Just lay your heart out to Him. All the hurts, all the neglect, the abuse, the dreams, the hopes, your fears, whatever's in your heart, just take your heart and pour out all the contents and let Him start to speak it, speak to you His, in those gentle tones. Open up your ears. God, we're here. Let us hear your voice. You stood before creation. Eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth to motion my soul now to stand you stood before my failure carried the cross for my shame my sin weighed upon your shoulders my soul now to stand so what could I say what could I do oh, but offer this heart oh God So I walk upon salvation Your spirit alive in me Yes, Lord There's life to declare Your promise My soul now to stand So what could I say? the one who gave it all I'll stand my soul Lord to you surrender all I am is yours I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all I'll stand so Lord, do you surrender all I am is yours. I'll stand, I'll stand 
God, we come to you needing to be rescued and realizing, God, we want to be rescued by this Jesus who is an owner like no other owner we've ever had, who will never neglect us, never reject us, never walk away from us, but is good in every single way. He understands who He made us to be. And He knows how we have become a a wild dog. Fending for ourselves. Trying to figure it out. Trying to make things happen. and Defending ourselves. When He says, come to me. All you who are weary. All of you who are tired of that. And let me be an owner to you like you have never, ever, ever ever know let me give you rest and Lord God whether we have known you for a day and are still wondering if we've just heard about you just today and are maybe realizing that maybe we should Think about this Jesus. And we hear what He is speaking to us and help us, Lord God. Draw us to Yourself. Whether that's we're just beginning this sort of curiosity process or whether we have known about Jesus for a very long time and have just not surrendered all the areas. Help us, Lord God, to trust every single thing to you who is an owner like no other. Thank you, loving, tender-hearted God. And we say it all because we have seen Jesus, seen the character of God lived out in Jesus. We say all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.